Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining the Perez Art Museum Miami online. I am Maria Elena Ortiz, I'm a curator, and I'm also leading the Caribbean Cultural Institute, an, initially, an initiative dedicated to the understanding and appreciation of Caribbean art. Tonight, we're hosting CCI's Art Talks Live, Myth and Spirituality in Caribbean Art. Before I continue, I wanna let you know that this program is actually being interpreted in both English and French, and you can get the adequate interpretation by going to your screen, clicking on interpretation and on the channel that you desire, that being English or French, and you'll be able to listen to the conversation at your language of preference. Also there, you're gonna see a box for Q&A, which you'll be able to post your question both in English and French, and we'll address it around 25 to 30 minutes from now when we go into the Q&A section. This program is presented with the generous support of the Mellon Foundation, who provide the fund to start the CCI initiative. I also need to give a special thank you to Memorial Act in Guadalupe, an exceptional institution that made the Artist Fellowship possible, and the Cultural Services of French Embassy for their general support here in Miami. I would also like to thank our incredible PAM team that makes this program possible. Thank you to our registration and collection departments for their support with our fellows. Also to our communications and marketing teams that make a great uh, job at promoting this event. And thank you to our amazing AV team made with Denise Faxa and Andrew Bird. I also wanna remind you that the open call for the 2021 fellowship is now open. The deadline is April 8th of this year. And you can find more information about that at cci.pam.org. Now tonight, we will hear from the 2020 CCI Fellows, artist Ronald Cirillo and PhD candidate Julian Sanchez Gonzalez. After their presentations, we will have a brief conversation with them and cultural and Caribbean Cultural Institute coordinator Iberio Perez and myself. First, Cirillo will briefly share his practice, followed by Sanchez Calderon analysis on three works of, of our collection from artists Arnaldo Rocha Ravel, Belki Sayon, and Purvis Young in relation to myth and spirituality. In collaboration with Memorial Act, Center Caribbean de Expresión et de Memoria de la Trait de Esclavage in Guadalupe, and, and excuse me for that, the 2020 CCI Artist Fellowship was awarded to visual artist Ronald Cyril, also known as Blackbird. During the fellowship, Cyril had a studio in the premises of Memorial Act where he produced a series of new works. As part of this program, Cirillo had the opportunity to engage in a series of virtual studio visits with international and regional scholars and curators, including Dr. Marsha Pierce, Claire Tancons, Dr. Terry Geis, Giscard Bouchet, and Simone Namji. Recognized for his public artworks and surreal imageries, Cirillo creates paintings, drawings, sculptures, and murals that present his personal mythology. His colorful and energetic brushstrokes reveal otherworldly figures in dreamlike settings, evidencing humor, satire, and Caribbean histories. Inspired by the writings of Edouard Glissant and Amy Cesar, Cyril evokes the lusciousness of the Caribbean landscape alongside the region's instability and idiosyncrasies. Cyril's work has been presented in solo exhibitions at prestigious venues such as the Volta Art Fair, New York, Remy Yunsat Cultural. Center, Ponte Prix Guadalupe, the Clement, the Fundacion Clement, and Atrium, both in Fort de France. Cyril has participated in group exhibitions at the Hunter East Gar Harlem Galleries, New York, the Little Haiti Cultural Center here in Miami, and Tout Le Monde Festival, among others. He lives and works in Guadalupe. Now, I will pass the mic to Ronald, who will be giving his presentation in French. So please make sure to click the English interpretation button if you need it. I know I do. And if you value this program and any other programs presented by the museum, please consider supporting us by joining and going to pam.org slash donate. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ronald Sirio. Bonsoir à tous. Bonsoir. 
Bonsoir à tous. Hello to all. Good evening. Bonsoir à tous. Bonsoir aux Hello to participants on the internet and thank you to Maria for this one introduction. I would like to thank Pam for this collaboration and the Institute for Caribbean Culture that enable me through this opportunity to develop my research and my work. I also want to thank Memorial Art that supported me in this project so this so that this uh, this be a success. I will talk about my work. So my artistic practice, it's, it's a narrative. I paint what uh, motivate me and what my concerns, the, the history, the dialogue between my present and my past is a personal my mythology that also encounters a Caribbean mythology, mythology of uh, legends and, and stories. Uh, I create uh, uh, fantastic uh, animals from my alphabet that becomes uh, is presented with different uh, his, uh, histories. So I talk about what my concerns and the, the characters evolve in different uh, settings. And it's like uh, souvenirs of my uh, youth. I talk about Green Paradise uh, lost the souvenirs of a green paradise lost in this first work. It's a series. Uh, so this uh, diptych is on, on paper, a paper you where I used a uh, plus. So what uh, cut out and pasted uh, forms. So this is a more, more pure, pure work. And so you have uh, these fantastic uh, beings. So these are forms, creatures that uh, from our Creole uh, songs and, and, and universe. So this uh, colored and cut out and pasted uh, work enables me to show the form with regards to the background. So this is a work that reminds me with very, it has very big contrast. What also is very interesting for me with my practice. So these are two papers united that I, I put one on the other and then I, I use a scalpel. So there are no errors. Once everything I do, I have to continue at the end. It cre creates a dialogue between the positive, negative, singular, and the plural. Next slide, please. So this is a technique that a different technique. It's a different technique. We here you have uh, something that I have uh, in uh, that I do in, in a photo lab. So it's not a perspective of the phot photographer, but the researcher I, in the lab. A dark room. I use all these products that I handle, hand, handlings that I want to uh, modify the paper, alter it, and create surprises. And when it's in the sun, I, I see that there are uh, forms that accidentally appear. And I use the grattage or acrylic techniques, and sometimes I erase or, or play with transparencies so so the lab that's where i create supports places where my uh, uh, characters will reside what is important for me in this work is that a lot of things uh, i cannot grasp for example the person the fat character on right is uh, on the right is accidental so next slide please Here you have something different. This is volcanic and cannibal. So this is a artwork. This is paint on a canvas. So I see, the, so you have this fantastic, so this is my alphabet. This is plastic uh, uh, that I used uh, to, for the Creole song. Every per 
character is isolated. I can create a relationship between these characters. These are animals. I talk about uh, fantastical beings because uh, we find them in mythology and and uh, and uh, histories that that are spoken and uh, talked and and shared. So these are. They, they become the characters, the center of my story. Sometimes you can, they can, these uh, uh, animals can look like uh, human beings and this is disturbing. We can continue, please. Next, Next slide, please. So this here, this is a sacred feminine. This is a painting with regards to, compared to uh, what was previously shown this is the the celestial and the terrestrial aspects are identifiable so this is from my souvenirs as a child these uh, this nature and these uh, uh, these landscapes uh, can are a really good setting for these stories so this is the um, mamand lo a mythical figure so from my these fantastical beings, I, I define this. I, Maman Lo is strong, powerful, dominates the landscape with all these elements, human, veg, uh, animal, and uh, plant-like. Uh, sorry, it uh, is. She's the keeper of the key of, to somewhere else, and the per, this. Uh, uh, has the, there's a serpent in the water, so we expect that Mamond Lo be in the water in general. Mamond Lo meaning mother water. So this is the it's still this narrative. So uh, So this is a name used by the 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 person who narrates the story. He uses to ask attract the public's uh, attention. So this is the dialogue. I decide to recreate these landscapes, which are, it's a mental landscape. This landscape has fragments of different landscapes that I visited or dreamt. And these are souvenirs of fragments of landscapes when I used to go to gardens with my grandparents. So I decided, I created a, a history. I put a narrative, I create tensions, uh, dialogues, and I create these landscapes and the green, the dominating green makes us dream. So these animals, uh, these goats, the portrait, the, the, my, fi my face is a way of, of showing my presence in this context and to bring my, my own mythology, to, to have a dialogue with mythologies of the, my territories for the, the Cas Creole, the Creole house is not only a, a housing, but is a support like I do uh, when my uh, interventions. Can we continue, please? So this is work that is completely different here. I'm, this is a dream, creating a new family of characters. These are portraits of unknown people imaginary people. So I use the mixed media on paper. So this is a nostalgia of the paper that we used to use to create uh, joy in the house. So I take this paper and there are different papers uh, and different motives. By putting them all together, this creates the universe of the character after that, you will have elements such as the key that becomes symbols by reusing it in the in my work. You can see in the the bee bird the motive on the T-shirt that to just to show a presence or a logic logical uh, thread in my work. We will continue. Next slide, please. So here, same spirit, but. This is not a uh, paper it's, it's, through uh, uh, processes to recreate the paper with the use of uh, the Kushwa and others uh, to how to get inspired because the paper, painted paper is to put this uh, the, uh, diverse papers together, elements together. And 
I put this character that is that is inspired by my fantastical animals and there are different and uh, characters that, that uh, compose the, the body because it's he seems uh, in, in balance, but he's dancing in the big D and so the classic dance move. So this can go back to the classical dance, but also to my own culture. So the next image, please, next please, next slide. So here we continue with this series of portraits of uh, unknown people, my new family, so in, in quotes. So this is my, the diptych. Uh, so this is the, so the painted paper and the pochoir, such as uh, the tapestry my grandparents used to use. Uh, I integrate them in my work, how I, they quote, they uh, they share the same space uh, everything i love and i hate for the, it goes back to connection or disconnection with nature and with us so the other element the other uh, the portrait next to it is this this diptych uh, work but sometimes i take a certain distance this two hands raised to the to the sky don't shoot you know so hands up don't shoot so so this is goes back to the Black Lives Matter movement, but also Claude. So, so the background is more quiet, but I still take a distance from the first by putting holes. So there could be bullet holes or a second layer, a second layer that talks about somewhere else that is not determined, hidden, that is there and suggested. Next slide, please. Here we will continue. I will not repeat myself because we're still in this, this, uh, in the same spirit. So the two formats where I intervene and I, I cut directly and then I introvert it. So I accompany it with characters from my alphabet, my alphabet bit of forms that I call the abecedaire, which is alphabet, and talks about the Creole song and, and with all the animals that you can find in the Caribbean, that like in, in our legends. So I the background is pure and I use and I work more graphically. He has two, the, this animal has two um, heads, my two cultures since I was born in Guadeloupe, but I grew up in uh, Dominique. Yeah. So this me and this myself. Next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, end with this one. So at the beginning, I, I started to dissociate both Big, big Bird and Renaud uh, Big Bird and Renaud are two different things, uh, but they are both interesting and they can dialogue. This is the relationship uh, dialogue, the importance thereof. So when I, uh, when I paint houses, the Creole house, I want to, people to forget about the house, that my intention uh, uh, they really, um, for like the the windows becomes the the eyes the the shoes the person the character itself and the bird of course that show that it's from big bird i thank you very much for your intention thank you for for your attention Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Ronald, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I would now like to introduce our next speaker, uh, the 2020 CCI Research Fellow, Julian Sanchez Gonzalez. Um, this presentation is going to be in English, so I would like to remind our audiences that we have language interpretation available. Um, you can see the instructions uh, in the slide. Uh, but basically you just click on the interpretation button on the lower left side of your screen and select English for French to English interpretation or French for English to French interpretation. So that said, um, I would like now to present our speaker. Julian Sanchez Gonzalez is a doctoral candidate in our history at Columbia University at the city of New York. 
and also holds a master's in art history from New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. His research focuses on the relationship between artistic and spiritual practices in modern and contemporary eras, particularly in Latin America, the Caribbean, and the United States. His PhD dissertation explores Colombia's first World, World Congress of Sorcery, a four-day international event organized in 1975 that included spiritual ceremonies, popular culture, art making practices, and gathered scholars and artists to discuss themes related to the magical, the supernatural, the surreal, and the occult. Sanchez Gonzalez's work has been supported by the Fulbright Program, the Ministerio de Cultura de Colombia, and Fundación Col Futuro. His writing has been published by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Colección Patricia Phelps de Cisneros in New York and Venezuela, Oxford Art Online, the Universidad 3 de Febrero eh, in Buenos Aires, and the Universidad Jorge Tadeo Lozano in Bogota. So without further delay, please help me welcome Julian Sanchez Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Iberia, for this kind introduction. Um, before I start my presentation, I would really like to express, express my infin, inf, uh, infinite gratitude to you and to Marilena for making this uh, research fellowship happen, especially in the current conditions of the health crisis we're going through. So I feel very privileged and very honored to be able to hold this position this year, last year, last year and this year, and to be able to show some of the results of the, um, of the research that I did uh, remotely from Bogota and also in Miami in November last year. So the uh, title for the article that will be ultimately published as the results of my research fellowship in, in PAM's website this spring um, is still in the works. Um, however, I have tentatively chosen a descriptive enunciation to make clear the intentions of the intellectual pursuits that I'm in the process of considering with this um, project. So Vessels of Myth, the Shamanistic Paradigm in the works of Belki Sayon, Arnaldo Rochella Ravel, and Purvis Young constitutes an experimental and interdisciplinary reflection on the relationship between the literature deriving from the history of comparative religions, particularly that of shamanism, anthropology and archaeology, and the most recent academic thinking in the history of the arts of the Caribbean region and the African diaspora. Um, next slide, please. So I'm considering the work of three different artists, um, Arnaldo Roger Ravel's Who's Son Am I? Belkis Ayon Manso's Untitled, uh, which is a depiction of the Princess Sikang with white tips, and Purvis Young's Spaceman. Uh, these three pieces are from the early 1990s and they belong to Pam's collection. And in, in the three of them, the artists depicted what seemed to be alter egos in a state of transition and transformation. Previous publications on the work of these three artists have rightly and fully connected their overall art artistic production with the spiritual and religious traditions of Judeo-Christianity in Puerto Rico for the case of Rocher Ravel, the secret society of Abacua in Cuba for the case of Ayon, and the presence of, presence of Santeria in Miami for the case of Young. However, these academic propositions all seem to deal uniquely with the work of these artists in relation only to themselves a tautological input that belies any contextual analysis or with artistic processes by other artists inspired by similar spiritual traditions. The latter falls short in providing a panoramic view of a larger cultural process of creative spiritual engagement. Moreover, in the cases in which the inherently permeable cultural backgrounds of these artists are acknowledged, theoretical tropes of hybridization and creolization tend to come to the fore as an explicative tool in the service of iconographic analysis. The useful but ultimately superficial identification of symbols, body language, uses of color and blank space then only gives us a glimpse into how we can possibly understand the work of complex and layered artists such as this ones. So in connecting the work of Rocher Ravel, Ayon Manso and Young, I propose a comparative analysis that could help us further understand from a theoretical and interdisciplinary standpoint, their connection and engagement with the spiritual world at large. For this, I am currently working through the methodologies as well as recent and not so recent proposals of the work of anthropologists, archeologists, and historians of comparative religion so as to integrate our cumulative knowledge on shamanism as a cultural practice within the historiography of art. A useful springboard for building this connection has been the work of Romanian historian of religion, Mercy Eliad, American mythologist, Joseph Campbell, 
Austrian Colombian anthropologist Gerardo Rachel Dolmatov, South African archaeologist David Lewis Williams, American medical anthropologist Michael Winkleman, and American cultural anthropologist Mary Weismantel. So of particular interest in the search has been Winkelmann's succinct proposition of the shamanistic paradigm, which he describes as a series of historically identified behaviors in which most shamans, that is individuals who serve as bridges with other worlds and supernatural realities, traditionally engage in, regardless of their cultural positionalities. Some of these key phenomenological exp experiences triggered by physical as well as spiritual conditions are posited as those of soul journey or soul flight in an altered state of consciousness, also known as ASC, and also described as a form of ecstasy, the abilities of divination, diagnosis and prophecy, spirit relations as foundational to professional capacities, and also initiatory death and rebirth experiences. So while I would not go so at, while I would not go as far as to claim that any of these three artists um, I chose as case studies could be effectively deemed as shamans in their context of origins or internationally for that matter, I do find useful, despite renowned controversies on these theories, particularly those posed by pre-Columbian art historian Cecilia F. Klein, to think of their life stories and creative processes under the light of the literature of shamanism. I see this as a strategy to find some answers to lingering questions about their work, and also as a way to help us broaden our interpretative horizons on the relationship between spirituality and art in the contemporary era. So in what's left of this presentation, what I, what I would like to do is to give you a very brief overview of the inquiries I'm currently thinking through in relation to the work of these three artists. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So born in Santurce, Puerto Rico, educated in San Juan and Chicago, I consider one of the most influential painters in the history of Caribbean and neo-expressionist art. Roger, Roger Ravel's work can be described as being in a constant pursuit for the understanding and portrayal of the paradoxical experience of the human condition. Some of the recurring themes in his impressive painterly practice, which came to a halt due to his death in 2018, include the representation of pain and agony, joy and bliss, individual and familiar relations, our perceived connection and this connection to the natural world and the sensorial possibilities of the corporeal and the incorporeal. In this work, I am fascinated by the ontological transgressions that this scene of simultaneous birth and sacrifice proposes as it positions the self-portrait of the artist as a holy man in the shape of a martyr, perhaps embodying the position of Jesus being crucified in, th in thinking of the shamanistic paradigm earlier described I am most interested in connecting this iconography with the idea of corporeal transcendence as a way of liberating or healing the body from its physical constraints. So one must ask indeed what these limitations are about and what was this artist in search for a recreation of his own personal mythopoesis or individual myth of origin in combining Western and African iconographies in such a violent composition. Taking a panoramic standpoint, it should be acknowledged also that this kind of narrative is not necessarily literal or personally bound, but rather a recurrent trope in mystical healing practices elsewhere. As Colombian anthropologist Luis Eduardo Luna has beautifully commented in the past, it is in the poetic and artistic renderings of the experience of the healing process enabled by the use of sacred plants in the Amazon rainforest that one can see the interconnectedness of the, holy, of the whole beyond their readily available bodily experience. This process shows itself as a violent wand, a crossing of a liminal boundary by force of necessity, as it requires the utmost deconstruction and reconstruction of the structures which the individual inhabits. Here, they become quite successful in bringing this agitated process to a pictorial materialization by virtue of his careful selection of iconography, composition, and technique. Next slide. The work of Cuban printmaker Belkis Bel Ayan Manso has garnered quite a lot of attention since her sister Katia and curator Cristina Vives organized a major traveling show of her artistic legacy in 2016, several years after her untimely death in 1999. Much of the literature written on her work before and after her death has largely focused on the long-standing academic and creative investment Ayon had with the Abakua, an all-male Afro-Cuban secret society with cultural and historical roots in Western Africa, particularly Nigeria. The myth of the Princess Sigan, a woman who was revealed the secret of life by the higher powers and divinities, 
and then sacrificed by the men of her tribe so that the secret would live amongst them is a recurrent trope in Ayan's work, notably since the mid 1980s. The desire of spiritual transcendence was expressed in interviews by the artist during her lifetime and is one of the reasons why she felt a personal affinity with Sikan Smith. So in this print from 1993, uh, Sikan's iconography is clearly identifiable in the spikes around her body as they symbolize her martyrdom. In this composition, she is tormented by winged figures that take sinuous shapes resembling serpentine beings, while a larger presence lo looms in the back, possibly hinting at the figure of Avasi supreme god and bearer of the secret that was given to her. This interpretation is further reinforced by the depiction of a sea creature, possibly a fish, on the upper left part of the composition, which is the worldly animal embodiment of Abasi as it encountered Sikan in the human world. What remains fascinating about the composition is that Ayan masterfully makes us part of a scene in which Sikan seems to be sinking into the underworld, a voyage of drowning underwater. According to David Lewis Williams, this type of iconography is recurrent in cave and rock art in many geographies throughout the world, and it is particularly evident in the markings left by the Sun peoples of Southern Africa over 70,000 years ago. This is also the way that shamanic, shamanistic trance states, or a ASC, have been described by psychonauts and explorers of the psyche of the contemporary era, such as the American ethnobotanist Terence McKenna. In overall terms, this process, terrifying as it is with the case of Rocher Roel, also signifies the attainment of supernatural powers, a quest in which Ayan openly shared an interest in. In more concrete terms, this could be effectively interpreted as a desire to exceed the conditions of what was given to her, both as a Cuban, a woman, a Black person, and as someone with extraordinary talents traveling the world, yet feeling constantly disenfranchised by her surroundings. Here we enter in a particularly powerful and fruitful discussion on the uses of spirituality as a vessel for social, political, and cultural resistance, which is particularly interesting to consider for artists active during the swift transformations taking place in Cuba during the early 1990s. Next slide. So to finalize, I would like to make um, also a few remarks about this last work. Uh, Purvis Young's prolific career as an artist was and still is to a large extent understood under the rubric of self-taught art within the framework of the ever-growing studies of the arts of the African diaspora in the US. However, the most recent exhibition of his work at the Rubel Museum, one of the largest, if not, if not the largest after Young's death in 2010, decidedly wished to position his paintings and drawings through the lens of their own terms, thematic explorations, preoccupations, and material interests. Active as an artist since the late 1960s in the Overtown neighborhood of Miami, Young was traditionally preoccupied with depicting the struggles of the different Black communities in his hometown and quickly developed a body of work that became increasingly complex, tapping into larger trends of contemporary painting, whether or not formally trained. One of the most significant of, this, of these was precisely his interest in rendering the recurrent figures of his work, such as pregnant Black women, Zulu warriors, and street protesters, in compositions in outer space, surrounded by planets, stars, and alien-like creatures. In this work, titled Spaceman, Young interestingly conflates two of his recurrent figures, slaves and angels, into a single being, a black astronaut, which is represented in a mountainous landscape, usually associated with a message of freedom as the antithesis of the urban center in Young's work. This figure is also joined in the composition by a number of horned smaller figures that dynamize the pictorial space and potentially speak of interplanetary travel, but also of demonic and diabolical associations given to the spiritual belief systems of the, of the African diaspora. So in thinking about this work in relation to the shamanistic paradigm of this research, I am particularly drawn to establishing a connection with the recent theorizations of black queer, the black queer time and space by academics such as Kara Keeling and Omi Seke Natasha Tinsley. In both of their recent writing, it is interesting to see how their work in clear resonance with previous writings by Cuban American queer theorist, Jose Esteban Munoz, link the possibility of seeing Afro-diasporic spiritualities as a form of exceeding the conventional limits of reality and creating the world anew. One where the possibility of being is enabled under the terms of one owns conditions and necessities. This is particularly important for the work of musicians and literary figures of the Afrofuturist movement in vogue since the, since the 1970s, 
an important case study for the linking of spirituality, politics, race, and artistic input. Contrary to the case of Ayon, this work then sig signals the possibility of soul flight, one that goes to another planet, but also one that will ultimately, and perhaps pessimistically, always be linked to the conditions of its original oppression. Here, Young makes a poignant case uh, for the limits of utopian thinking and defies the possibilities of liberation within the conditions of material and physical inequality. This reminisces by a poetic, spiritual, and artistic means the work of theorists associated with the field of cultural studies since the 1980s, famously, famously spearheaded by figures such as Stuart Hall. So with these reflections, I think it would be good for us to start, start off the Q&A. I would be very curious to know your thoughts and to engage in conversation with Marilena, Iredia, and uh, Ronald. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Ronald and Julian, for such uh, lovely introductions to your work and practice. I wanted to um, start, I'm going to go through the questions that I have here shortly. Um, so if you have more, please go ahead and put them on the Q&A section. And as you put in your questions, I wanted to ask quickly to Ronald. Um, you know, in, in Julian's presentations, we saw a lot about how these artists were using myth and uh, mythology and just also African desperate religions to speak about a type of resistance within the Caribbean landscape. And I was wondering if you, if that's also something that resonates in your work. Like, do you use, do you um, allude to your childhood uh, stories and so on to speak about a certain chaos or, um, or challenges within the Caribbean? We. Oui. Mm. Uh, I, I will answer, I can answer in English, but I can also answer in French, I don't really know. Whatever works for you. Yes, I mean, because I grew in Dominica in a kind of way. Uh, we have a lot of story that's the same in Guadeloupe. When we also talk like thing, uh, stories about the Sukuyan uh, in, in Dominica, like uh, a singer like jo Jeff Joseph did a song on it, about it. Um, yeah, and in Guadeloupe, we also have what we call les contes. Les contes uh, in French sont des histoires que qu'on raconte que, et puis moi ça m'inspire beaucoup. So it's about um, or my personal mythology. So a time will be meeting with my uh, myth legend and count of the countries from the area from the Caribbean, also uh, not only Dominica but Guadeloupe and and Martinique. Like sometimes the piece when I, I talk about the sacred feminine and I was saying about, uh, uh, what's her name again? It's a mythological character. You can find her in the, throughout the Caribbean, the link resistance for example uh, in my representation the way I choose to represent things is already a kind of reason res resistation uh, why because uh, I mean uh, I, I have a classic uh, formation I went to art school in 2012, I had my master's in arts. And the question of the representation of the standards, the beauty standards. So in reference, all of that I questioned thoroughly when I started creating. So that's why my uh, fantastical beings uh, were born. So, the, it's, I use my imagination. I can, I answer to your question. I'm, in, I'm inspired by my souvenirs, by my... Your memories, my memories. Yes. yes. Yes, your memories. So it's not only the content, but also the aesthetic um, uh, choice that you make by the way you depict your... Yes, your, because... Um, yes. Like when I, when I talk, lorsque je parle du chien uh, créole, uh, because right. I want to talk about vagabondage and things like that. Je de la, le, le when design. I talk about uh, the, the dog, or to talk about uh, 
errant beings, but, but also mental and physical er, uh, people that are just walking through. So I don't take the dog the way it is. I take a certain distance. I destructure it. So I decompose. I take some distance, not to represent it, but to present things in another angle. So I define things the way I am. What is important is the essence. When I look at this Creole dog, I want to talk about uh, errant beings and I want to, I, uh, I only to look at some a part of his uh, uh, face and and it becomes a, a bird and it becomes a, a, a as I create a different world there are imaginary and real animals so so we go back to philosophy of the tout monde tout monde of Edouard Glissant le tout monde a multiple roots. I was born in Guadeloupe. I grew up in Dominique. I came back. Even my, my animals, my grandparents, they were uh, fishermen. So I, I use different parts and create something new. So the, the character is what I call my plastic uh, vocabulary. My alphabet comes, is mixed. So there's always a new creation. It's a creation that is inspired from the what is seen, what is lived, but it rooted from in my dreams, my my wishes, and I'm spiritual but not religious. So there's a, a there's a, a certain way that I take in my creation. So I just walk, I err, and not knowing where I go. So these are, so the things I use become a word, becomes a gesture. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting how in both your presentations, um, of the, the three artists that Julian discusses and also like in your work, uh, Ronald, uh, we can see uh, this blend of disparate traditions and beliefs, um, you know, how myth conflates with reality. Um, and there are also like certain ideas or uh, elements that resonate or that recur. And one of those uh, that I noticed from your presentations is the mask or this idea of masquerading. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you could, like both of you could address that question, like how does the masquerade uh, function, uh, Ronald, in your work? And then Julian, uh, that appears, uh, I remember in the, in the work of uh, Roche Ravel. And maybe we could also think of, um, of that idea of the masquerade in relation to Belki Sayon's work. Um, so maybe we can start with, Ronald, you wanna start? <laughs> okay, why not? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the mask, can I put the mask? We all have a mask. Uh, our skin is, first of all, is a kind of mask for me. And it's true that uh, the mask is toujours la question de l'apparence. It's a question of the appearance of looks. The, uh, how, what you show, what you, what is hidden, what you reveal. So to wear a mask is also is to question what you give others to see. And this mask is linked to my culture. In the Caribbean, we are French. We're Caribbean. I'm from Dominique and Guadeloupe. I'm in Guadeloupe. I'm in Dominique. I'm French. So. My, our cultures, our identities are multiple, are multiple identities in the Caribbean. So the mask uh, also is present in different tri tribes. It's part of our heritage. And this is that when he talks about the memory of the memories. So, so this is, these are elements that are important. We have with COVID, unfortunately, this cannot happen, but we call, we have carnival. This is a, a perfect time where people decide sometimes to, to put aside who they are on an everyday life. And, and for one day, one week, one night, they will be somebody else. So it's the capacity to choose, but also this mask. Go back, goes back to this society. It's a form of protection. It is also the hole, the keyhole for the one looking, the one looking in is masked. 
he can see everything from the other, but the others cannot see everything from about him. So this is a game between the person who's observed and the person who's doing the observing. Beyond this, with regards to the mask, we've noticed in a, it's a series of uh, theater plays. So there are elements that come back, that is, are transformed in this mask, is a, like a, a wink to COVID. It's not the mask of COVID, but it's how to question things differently. So in my culture, these, they are left undetermined when we're talking about Dolly's uh, moment law. Things are in between, uh, in between space, because I have the space to give my own version and speculate. The mask is always, I see it, but I don't always know. So what I don't see, I can, I can guess. Yeah, thank you for that question. Anyway. Merci pour ça. I think what Ronald is saying is about persistence and about trying to, or effectively becoming something else by wearing a mask is a very powerful statement. Um, and it's definitely something that I uh, strongly resonate with when I think about the work of these three artists. Um, it's the fact that in the way that they're representing their alter egos, they're also proposing a new reality. Um, so this kind of creation of a different identity, I think, is highly linked to the practices of mass creating the Caribbean, for sure. Um, and uh, in that sense, it is also linked to uh, the different spiritual practices, whether hybrid or, where, or whether coming from one specific place, um, and how they incorporate that, incorporate that into their own creative process. Um, I think this, this idea of the carnivalesque as something that inherently subverts the uh, structures and the traditions of, you know, logocentrism and uh, a very structured way, maybe like a grid-like structure of understanding reality uh, is, is, is um, embedded into, into this idea of, of the masquerading practices. And so, for instance, in the work of Rocher Ravel, we see this like birthing scene uh, in which what it, could be considered this female figure in the composition is wearing an African mask and the artist himself is represented as a figure of Jesus or a saint that has been crucified. And so, you know, that speaks volumes to me about that intersection of cultures on, on, one, on, on one end, but also on the other end of this idea of inter indeterminacy because it's really hard to really capture uh, the real meaning, meaning of a work like this. You know, it's very convoluted, but it's also multifarious. Um, and so the inclusion of those different cultural elements uh, in, in, in a composition like that, I think uh, adds to the uh, mystery, but also the power in terms of how they can politically and culturally resist to impose um, ways of understanding not only their art making practices, but also, you know, other cultural cues that were definitely embedded in the way that they were raised um, in their countries of origin. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very long discussion and, you know, I'm thinking a lot about um, Claire Tancons and Lisa Thompson work on, you know, mass grade and carnivalist practices in the Caribbean on mass. Um, and there's so much there that can be unpacked, but yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Yeah, and I just was saying that um, that in, in Roche's work, so the juxtaposition between like his self-portrait with the mask and blue eyes versus like then the mother with the African mask, um, no, like mother was a mulata. So he's also speaking about um, these tensions or like conflicts of identity in relation to race, uh, but also in relation to his heritage, um, no, like his Africa, Afro-Caribbean Afro heritage, but also then he's more like European or Spanish uh, heritage. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you both for that. I wanted to start by taking some questions from the audience. Um, here it says, um, the first one by an anonymous attendee, I have two previous young paintings with what I regard as angels watching over Overtown a large figure with a halo surrounded by buildings, cars, and dancing figures. The spaceman's helmet looks like a halo. The Purvis Young practice Santeria? Is the spaceman a sort of human angel? I love that question. And I really appreciate the fact that, you know, they capture those details because those are actually one of the most important details that I was thinking through. 
um, when um, uh, when seeing his work. So, you know, one of the re really big tropes of Purvis Young's um, oof is the angel. Um, as I said in my presentation, both the angel and the slave are conflated into this one figure as the astronaut, um, you know, has shackles around uh, his uh, uh, hands and also his feet. Um, and so what I think is really interesting is the fact that um, by propelling this figure to outer space, uh, he's also uh, thinking about ways of thinking the world anew, of creating different realities, uh, but also I think it's a way of healing and of creating hope, which is the reason why he constantly depicts angels over, um, over town and over Miami in, in his work. Um, as you know, some of you may know, uh, Purvis's work was highly interested in depicting the struggles of the different black communities that you know, you know, uh, inhabited the neighborhood that he was originally born in. And uh, not only he depicted you know, street protests and also um, needles representing you know, the use of drugs and uh, uh, black women pregnant as a way of signaling hope, but also you know, the angels represented this idea that a better future was to be construed or was to be built and that was possible. And so in this kind of like really strange Afrofuturistic or not as strange, but rather unusual for his work Afrofuturistic gesture of combining the astronaut with the angel, I think is making a really, really powerful work uh, um, message uh, that I am really interested in, in, in flashing out more in the article um, that I will be publishing later in the spring. So yeah, thank you, that's, that's wonderful. Now, we have another question by Jeff Donnelly uh, where they ask, to what extent are these works influenced by colonial religions, Protestantism and Catholicism? The works of, uh, well, Belkis um, and Arnaldo Rocher are definitely influenced by Catholicism. Um, uh, you know, both of them constantly depict images of uh, crosses and, uh, you know, crucifixions and, uh, but, you know, it's a hybridized language. So that's definitely there for sure. And, you know, we know this is a fact for different Afro-Cuban religions. And even though um, Arnaldo was, uh, to my knowledge, never associated with an Afro-Puerto Rican religion, um, he was part of that cultural context growing up. And, um, there are certain texts that uh, position his work in relation to Santeria as well. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know more about that side of, of the story for, for his own personal uh, experience. But, you know, the, the, the work of and the, and the imagery of uh, Catholicism is definitely present um, in, in his work. Uh, for the case of Purvis, um, he was very mysterious about his own personal affiliations with spirituality, although he had a really close friend that was a Santero, uh, a famous Santero from Miami in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, and he was really critical of the church, although we're not entirely sure whether he was a practicing Protestant or Catholic. But, you know, that's kind of like indeterminate. But I think that in, in his own personal spiritual world, there was definitely a mix of different things that belonged to his own um, upbringing, as well as to, you know, people that influenced his life story as he grew up and uh, created his work in, in, in Overtown. Now, thank you. Can, can I just comment one thing? Uh, because I think the fact of, that you brought up, Julian, about uh, Roche in relation to Santeria is very interesting and one like worth probably uh, looking into further because um, I, I do remember like some scholars that have discussed that and I think Edward Sullivan has, uh, for example, addressed that and uh, saying that, for instance, like Roche's faces uh, of figures, some of his figures and faces we call like uh, Oricha deities. And also like with the use of, for instance, like color, like yellow, that is a very important color within uh, Orisha rituals. Uh, it's also very present in, in Roche's work. Um, and obviously the importance of syncretism that you would find, you know, in, in Santeria um, and that is present in, in, in Roche's work, the interaction between like nature, like nature, spirit, spirit man. I mean, there are many different aspects of, of Santeria that kind of, that you can see. Maybe it's not an explicit um, reference, 
but but there are like uh, resonances or, or different, um, let's say like uh, connections that could be potentially explored. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was, I also have another question for Ronald. It says, Ronald, as a graffiti artist, you have to create when law enforcement and the general public doesn't disturb you. I would imagine that you work mainly at night. What role does night time play in your overall work, including your paintings? And this is by Alex Pierre. Oh, Alex. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll say that at the beginning, I'd start at, at night time, but it's true that uh, first in, uh, fast enough, people start to, to know who was Bieber because in a kind of way, we, we're not living in a big country. We're living on a small island and everybody knows everybody's on, on the island. So. That's how things come to come true. So I mean, at a certain time, I wasn't like waiting on night time to go and paint. I was like feeling like uh, act like this is like I going to do a crime. So at a certain time, I just decide, okay, well, I'll feel free and I go in and work all day, like morning time, afternoon, don't matter. And is this was important enough for me because I believe is at this time I I start to meet people and start to really. Uh, hear yeah, what they was thinking about my work and what they was appreciate, appreciating my work. And that's how I decide to make a kind of statement and say that, okay, right. Well, right, by right now, the bird will do what he want when he want and don't matter if the police come, well, I will just have to talk with the guys and explain them, well, this is what I do and I, tr I, I share in my universe in this type of way. And yeah, I mean, in the week, I was doing some street art and some pass, and right now we can be talking and we just have respect because they themselves they also dreaming. I mean, yeah, that's 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 a part of the real story. Police, government, everybody dreaming, and me, and my my job is to share my dream. Now, I will ask one last question because we're almost we're at the end, um, and and I'll ask. <laughs> It's by John Pierre, and he asks, or they ask, we speak of realization in language, but do you see it? Do you see it in art? And if so, how? And I think that we can all probably all speak to this question, which is why I, I, I think it's a good question to end the program with. Yeah, that's a nice. Um, question. Anybody wants to take it? I mean, yeah. Well, I can start in a kind of way. Uh, realization. Uh, I'll take it in French. I'll feel more, more comfortable. Realization, uh, see. Realization. We will go back to the Edouard Glissant's concept. For me, this is the relationship. So I feel, how can I say? In a type of sort of a creolization in what I give to see in my work on a literary uh, basis uh, level. From what I've seen from the works from Edouard Lisson, seems that it went in the direction of abstraction. But uh, for, for the creolization, I, this is a relationship established with uh, uh, fragments of an object. I find I am at home when I create my these hybrid creatures. They are, they are created from fragments of uh, ex existence and I find a new space where they live together and there's a type of balance. And for me, this is my way of how to, cre to show creolization in my work without trying to enter in this, uh, in defining the problem like that. But in my re plastic research, this is how I see things. Yeah, I think this, this is um, one really beautiful aspect about the notion of creolization or creolization as uh, Lisan understands it, is that creolization doesn't mean synthesis, but rather the um, integration of different cultural elements in a way that each cultural element also remains uh, integral and does not fade into 
that process of blending. Uh, but at the same time, in that creolization process, there is an aspect of mystery that remains um, as, in as much as we don't really know for sure or entirely um, how the identity process functions. And so there's a, an, an, an aspect of mystery there that is, that is really fascinating in the way that Glissant theorized about, you know, the postmodern subject, the postmodern identities of the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and when I take a look at the work of artists who engage with different, spir different spiritual systems, I feel that, that that is precisely what happens when the different blends of, um, of uh, spiritual denominations come into play. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this earlier, Marilena and Iberia, you know, in, 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 during my uh, trip, trip to Miami, I had the opportunity to see the work of contemporary artists like Nicole Salcedo and Vicky Pierre, uh, who are, you know, fascinating in what they do and they take clear direct cues from the work of artists like Belki Sayon and uh and Purvis Young and so forth um and you know I see this element of you know trying to understand the mystery of identity and enjoying the, the sublimity of what that means but at the same time not fully trying to understand what it is so it's like this tension between knowing but not knowing too much um and a thing that keeps on happening uh in the creative processes of artists um who were influenced by, you know, the, uh, this artist that I'm researching from the early 1990s. Um, so there's this whole like thread, theoretical thread that can be uh, drawn, uh, which I think is really fascinating to, to explore. And, you know, creolization is definitely like a springboard for that kind of analysis. Well, if there are any more, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, I want to say thank you for to, to all of everybody here. That all only our fantastic panelists, but also evening with us. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we do have the 2021 CCI Research Fellowship open call. Uh, the deadline is April 8th. And we're offering opportunities to curators, artists, researchers, scholars, cultural practitioners based in Florida, the Caribbean, and also diaspora. And if you have any questions, please visit our website, cci.pam.org. And also, if you want to hear more about our wonderful panelists, you can follow Ronald on Instagram, look him up as a Blackbird. And Julian, you can reach him also um, through us or through any other means and also his writing. And we look forward to sharing. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you both again uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the CCI and everyone. Uh, thank you again to uh, our AV team. Uh, and thank you to our audience for coming tonight and being with us tonight. So thank you all, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, Celestin, thank you all for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And let's stay connect to you also. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.